here we are here we are it is november 22nd y'all it is november 22nd how did it become november 2021 so quickly and how is it thanksgiving already i don't know if you are joining me i'd love for you to pop in the comments who you are and where you're joining me from and what you want to talk about boundaries today so my name is Michelle Marquardt DeVoe, if you don't already know me, hello. And today we're kind of going to chill out because we're going to talk about one of those things that's a little bit messy, a little bit messy, um, how to create and implement holiday or even everyday boundaries. So again, go ahead and pop in the chat. Let me know who you are. If you haven't signed up with Ecamm to let me know who you are because it'll pop up, please do that. And let me know where you're tuning in from. Hey, Jennifer, had a great session with Jennifer on Friday, by the way. She's baller. You got to know Jennifer and um, doing big work. Uh, and so I want to talk about boundaries because I think it's one of those things that, you know, it's very sexy to talk about boundaries, right? Like everybody has, hey, Stephanie, hey, Grace, hey, Grace. Um, it's very sexy to talk about boundaries, right? It's very, there's lots of memes. There's lots of encouraging things that we uh, share, like gifts and stuff. There's there's even kind of this hyper responsiveness to people pushing boundaries, right? Like they shouldn't be doing it. Like there's almost a defensiveness around boundaries. And so I wanted to talk about boundaries today because they will most certainly come up during the holidays for both your clients and maybe your immediate family, maybe your extended family, maybe your friends um, around so many things like your time, your mental energy, um, what you feel comfortable with. I mean, let's there's a whole bunch of different risk tolerances right now and all over the world, depending on what the COVID situation is, you know, all of this kind of thing. So I wanted to kind of get to the nitty gritty today. Hi, Alicia. Hey, Elizabeth. Hello, Karen. Um, but I want to do it in a way that's like, can we just get real around boundaries instead of just thinking that boundaries is like aggressively drawing a line in the sand and being an asshole to people that make you feel upset or defensive? Because that's not boundaries, friends. In fact, that kind of defensiveness and responsiveness to when people uh, push your boundaries shows that you need some growth area in what boundaries are and how to implement them. So let's get down to business. How to create and implement, I put how create. Okay, how great. Let me put how to create. Jeez, Michelle, learn to spell. It's a holiday week. It's a holiday week. So I get that. How to create these things. So let, let's talk about what a boundary is, first of all. A boundary is uh, their rules, guidelines, um, limits that a person creates to identify for themselves what are reasonable safe and permissible ways for other people to behave around them and this is the key how they will respond when someone steps outside of those limits so again with all like the sexy boundary stuff we like to talk a lot about you know what we will and won't tolerate but we don't take that extra step, which is actually the more difficult step, which is de deciding who we want to be in that moment when it happens and then implementing and um, enforcing the boundary. Because it's very easy to set a boundary. It's very easy to feel that anger rise up. It's very easy to say, I am not OK with that. But what's not easy is to then address the issue and say, I'm not okay with this and I need to talk about it or no thank you or because it doesn't even have to be a big deal, right? It could just be like a no thanks um, without the cycle. So boundaries, again, they're guidelines, rules or limits that a person creates to identify for themselves. Your boundaries might be different than my boundaries. Um, what are reasonable, safe and permissible ways for other people to behave and how we're going to respond when someone steps outside of those limits. So in order to get a good idea of this, we kind of want to know the difference between well, what's a healthy boundary and what do healthy boundaries look like? And then what do unhealthy boundaries look like? Because on top of this, we're not actually sure what a healthy boundary even looks like. What's permissible? What, what does it mean to have a healthy boundary or an unhealthy boundary? 
So I want to give you just a some characteristics of unhealthy boundaries. And I just want you to kind of sit down, take some breaths, because you might hear some things or be experiencing some things when I read this list that make you go, ooh, ooh, e, ooh, right? So just breathe through it. And remember, that's part of what boundaries are, is learning that you have them. And when you first learn about how maybe you haven't had one and the reasons behind that, it can be pretty yucky. Like I put in my email to the list, my email list last week. I'm like, it is, it brings up some mega stuff when you start to figure out your boundaries because you really start to realize how you've allowed people to treat you in the past. And uh, so here we go. Some characteristics of unhealthy boundaries, sharing too much too soon. Okay. Um, or on the other end of the expression um, thing, just like, yeah, do you like my shirt? Thanks. Uh, closing yourself off and not expressing your wants and needs. So every time you feel a need come up, you just like, never mind, you know, that kind of thing. Being hyper, I'll do it myself. Um, and then also just gushing very early on, sharing things that might not make another person comfortable without asking. Another example of an unhealthy boundary is feeling responsible for another person's success or happiness. And I'm pointing this out, especially for us uh, voice teachers and voice related people in any perform any helper industry, really, in service based industry is um, I see this a lot where we kind of take ownership of our students successes um, and ownership, <clears throat> excuse me, of our students failures. So what might come up a lot in this holiday season is, you know, you get a last minute email or text or call from a student who needs help with like the holiday service they're supposed to sing in two days, right? And our desire to see them happy and successful might tempt us to go ahead and put them on the calendar, even though we promised ourselves we were going to do that admin work that day, or we promised ourselves we were going to um, take a break and take the day off or something like that, right? So feeling responsible for another person's happiness or success is a big one. You want to kind of watch out for that. You can help people be successful and you can absolutely help people be happy, but it is not your responsibility. At the end of the day, their success is their success. Their happiness is theirs. Third, the inability to say no, this kind of goes in with the second one, the inability to say no for fear of rejection and abandonment. Um, if, we, if we feel like we just cannot say no to somebody, we need to just kind of center our bodies, feel where that is in our bodies and, and realize like, hmm, I want to say no. Why am I not saying no? It's fear. There's a there's an unhealthy boundary there. Uh, for a weak sense of our own identity, <clears throat> when we have based how we feel about ourselves on how other people treat us or talk about us. Um, again, performers, right? Yeah, us performers. Uh, we often find our identity and our value in the perceptions of others because it is, um, it feels good. It feels good to have people love us. It feels good to have the applause. I mean, we love the applause, right? Like that. I mean, why we perform to gift emotion and gift performance to other people, but we also do it for ourselves. The tricky business is when it starts to cross over into now I am unhappy or now I don't feel like myself when I'm not getting that feedback loop, right? Um, and the last one I want to mention today, a characteristic of an unhealthy boundary is disempowerment. And so Jennifer, I see you typing. I'm learning to say, send me more information. Yes, <laughs> Please always ask more questions before you say yes to anything. Like, what kind of time commitment is this? We're going to get that into a minute. But I think you, I think peep up for this one, Jennifer. Disempowerment. When we allow others to make decisions for us, we feel powerless and unable to take responsibility for our own lives. So really pay attention to the areas where you feel someone is trying to force you to make a decision for them or 
where you're trying to make a decision for somebody else. Again, like control, right? Like you, agency and control. So Elizabeth is saying, send me more information, saving that language for next time. Absolutely. You know, so uh, those are just some things to like look out for. And does anyone, you know, after I did those five kind of signs, does anyone kind of be like, oh, that's me. I kind of see I might resemble some of those remarks. Right. You know, and here's the thing about boundaries, too. It's not like you like fix them and then you're done. It's these are it's a living thing where you're, you might be negotiating them on the daily. Right. And you might your boundaries might change over time. So Sarah's like raising both hands. <laughs> Right. So um, I think especially, too, with women um, in our culture still, we're still in a, a pretty well, I don't want to get too deep into this because like it's a thing that could be its own life all in, a, in and of itself. But I think, too, as women, especially uh, white women, we are we tend to be told two things at one at the same time. We're told draw boundaries, draw boundaries, draw boundaries, don't take shit from anyone, and also help everyone and fix everything. It is your responsibility to help everyone and fix everything while at the same time not stepping on anyone's toes and being your own, you know, lady boss and like all this kind of thing. So it can be extremely disconcerting because you're like, well, what's the difference between helping a person and like just letting my boundary be trampled? And they get super tangled up and you can't figure it out. And this is where I would say, I'm not a therapist. If that is where you're, if you're getting super tangled up in that, absolutely professional help. Absolutely. Therapist, counselor, classes, <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff. Get somebody who can walk you through that. If you're kind of like boundary of the light and you just need some support around language and stuff, we can definitely help you over and speak easy cooperative with that. But if this is a really deep identity issue, therapy we love therapy over in psycho um jennifer saying oof why can't they all be happy without me or you exactly right okay so on the flip side though what are some healthy boundaries like what are some what are some ideas of healthy boundaries and when it is when it feels good to have a boundary valuing your personal boundaries and not compromising them for someone else like being okay that what you want is okay you don't have to explain yourself right saying no and accepting when other people say no so here's a big sign that you need to work on your boundaries let's say you cross a boundary with somebody and they put the boundary up right? You're not, it's not like you meant to, you just did, right? Because who knows until somebody tells you. If you are uncomfortable with the fact that somebody has drawn a boundary and asked you to behave in a different way, and that makes you mad, that's something to think about in terms of how you are processing your own boundaries, right? There's some resentment there that they're getting what they want and you're not getting what you want. You got to think about that. Ouchie, ouchie. Meredith says, sometimes when I struggle, I just imagine what I do or say if I were a man. Oh, again, another live. Um, and by the way, well, I'm not going to say that. I don't need to say that. Drawing a boundary. Okay, another healthy boundary, knowing who you are and what you want and communicating that to others. Okay, so just knowing what you want, like people, let me just tell you this, people are going to cross your boundaries left, right and center. Like it is inevitable. It's not something that you stop. You don't preemptively stop people from crossing your boundaries. What it is, is again, how you respond to that and communicating clearly and with kindness and gentleness without jumping down people's throats is healthy boundaries, right? Engaging in appropriate sharing. I'd love to tell you a story. Okay, I'm going to be vulnerable, you know, using language like I'm going to be vulnerable right now. Is that okay with you? Like, okay, I'm going to talk about something that might be uncomfortable. You know, this is why we have content warnings and trigger warnings on um, social media posts. It's a way to help people navigate their own boundaries when you've got just like a feed throwing stuff at you, right? Not letting others define you or your sense of self-worth. We talked a little bit about that. Here's one. Know that your needs and your feelings are just as important, just as important, just as important, equally important 
as the needs and feelings of others. Your feelings are not less valuable than your spouse's or your in-laws or your students or your students' parents. Your feelings are just as valuable. They are equal and they need to, they need to be respected. You don't have to set yourself on fire to keep someone else warm. That's not how this works. Knowing that you have a right to your emotions and your feelings. So here's what happens too, right? You feel a boundary cross, you get angry, you get upset, you get a little defensive. And then what do you do? Oh, I shouldn't feel that way. I shouldn't feel that way. I shouldn't feel that way. It's fine to feel that way. Again, it's not the feeling that's the problem. It's like, are you going to go be an asshole about it with that feeling? Or are you going to be a grown person and like have a conversation when you have that feeling? Or are you going to process through and say, that feeling really comes from something that I'm not happy about myself that I need to work on? Are you really offended or are you just resentful that you couldn't deal with something inside of yourself? Right? That's a good question. I ask myself that question a lot. Am I mad at you or am I mad at me? <laughs> right? Figure that out first. Who are you mad at? Them or yourself? <laughs> Lastly, respecting others. This is a big one right now, y'all. Respecting others' values, beliefs, and opinions while knowing that respecting them does not mean that you have to change or compromise your own values, beliefs, and opinions. You can respect someone else's opinion no matter how fucked up it is. You can let them have that without compromising your own. And when I say how fucked up that is, that's also yet a whole other live about who determines what a fucked up, you know, value is. But, you know. Okay. Give me some feedback. What are you noticing about characteristics of unhealthy boundaries and characteristics of healthy boundaries? Meredith is saying, that's my thing right there, but I don't know. Which thing, Meredith? Which thing right there is it? I do not know. And I love this. Yep, a good friend who's an AA likes to say no is a complete sentence. Yep, no. No, thank you. No. I love it. Okay. Well, then let's move on oh, while I wait for you to ch chat with me. So uh, others are more important. Ah, uh, yeah, they're not, Meredith. Equal, equal value. Equal value. Yeah. It's so hard to do and super important. Okay. So what do we do? How are we going to figure out the next six weeks? How are we going to figure out how to navigate when we've got what students who are last minute texting us or trying to show up to lessons when we already said that we were closed or needing holiday music in the last minute or right. How are we going to navigate families? How are we going to navigate people who want to talk about stuff that we don't want to talk about? What about people asking questions of us that we don't want to answer? What about topics we don't want to discuss? You know, everyone, it's funny because, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, it's going to be welcome to the holidays where it's always going to be like politics and religion. I'm like, you can stop that. Like, you can gently say to the people at your table, your opinion is valuable and important, and I would love to hear it not today. I would love to hear it not today. I would love to hear that at a time when I can create space for listening to that if you even want to. But it's 100% okay for you to look at a member of your family and say, I love you. And, and today is a day that I want to feel safe in my own home or safe in your home. And having this conversation with where I'm at right now in this moment doesn't feel safe or comfortable to me. Can we talk about something else? I know you've been up to X, Y, Z. Tell me a little bit more about that. Or I'm not sure what you've been up to lately in terms of what you're doing for fun or hobbies. What's going on with you? Tell me a little bit more about that. So you have a right to say to a person in your family, I love you and I don't want to talk about that. Two things can be true. I'm not saying this is easy, by the way. Nobody's saying this is easy. First, we want to ask ourselves, how do we want to spend our time over the next six weeks? 
How do you want to spend your time? Ask yourself that. Do you want to spend it with people or without people? Do you want to take a lot of time off and rest and rejuvenate? Do you want to spend a lot of your time in rehearsal for your own performances and your own um, church gigs? Because the holiday season is full of, um, if you're in a church environment, you know, you're going to have a ton of like holiday obligations, especially around Christmas. If you do like Christmas masses and like all that kind of thing. How do you want to spend your time? Make a list and start the list with I want. I want to rehearse 20 minutes a day. I want to see 15 students a week. I want to not work on the weekends. I want all of these things, you might notice that as you start making this list, you're like, hey, I want this for my whole entire life. And I think that's okay. So I sneakily wooed you into a life boundaries conversation by talking about the holidays. I'm so sneaky. All right. So how do you want to spend your time over the next six weeks? Then we're going to ask this one. How do I want to feel over the next six weeks? Do I want to feel rushed? Do I want to feel at peace? Do I want the hustle and bustle? Like, do I want to feel busy and energized and excited? Do I want to feel like I have something to do every day that celebrates the season? Or do I want to feel like a cocoon? Do I need a cocoon right now? Do I want to feel nurtured and warm? However you want to feel, decide that and write that down. And then lastly, I want you to figure out what support you will need in order to get this. Now, this is where it's a little bit tricky and where you kind of have to work on the boundary thing as you ask the question, because what you'll discover is you're like, oh, I need someone to help me. I need someone to empower me and say, I'm glad that you said no, but that requires another person. Am I allowed to ask for that? Right. What kind of support do you need? Do you need a group of people that you can just say, hey, I'm trying to stay accountable to something? Can you check in on me? Do you need your partner or your spouse or your kids to agree to something? Hey, kiddos, my kids have year around school. So here's a great example. My kids have year around school. They are off track right now, which means they are not in school from today until the new year. So the entire holiday season, they're home. I had to go upstairs this morning and say, okay, y'all, I'm doing a Facebook live at nine. My boundary is that you not come in my room unless someone is bleeding or their face is bashed in. Please do not fight and please go make your own breakfast, (laughs) right? Drawing those boundaries. Um, Maybe from your partner, right? Like, hey, I need you to cook every night and I need you to do the laundry because those are usually the household things that I take care of, but I'm going to be in rehearsal getting ready for the holidays. Sarah is saying... Over here, I want to feel like I am trying something new that feels healthier and safer to me. I love that. What does that look like? What does that look like? (laughs) Um, Write down some, and this is like, this isn't like ethereal, y'all. This isn't like, what would it be like? It's like, really, what do I need? Grace is saying, wow, super mom boundaries. Well, I don't. I don't consider myself a super mom. I don't really think that I'm a better mom or a worse mom than any other person. But what I do think I've done is I've had the hard conversation with myself about if I want to run this business, if I want to do what I want to do to empower other people with their businesses and their lives and all of that, what kind of space do I make for my kids? And what kind of space do I make for my clients? And I think, you know, as a parent, I know not everybody who is part of SECO or who listens here is a parent, but I think it's kind of interesting to have that realization as a parent to say, I can have space for both of these things in my life, my family and my work, but I'm the one that has to make decisions on what that's going to look like. So on the flip side, Grace, yeah, I told them that. But they also know yesterday that I said, okay, in the afternoon at three o'clock, I am done with clients and let's, what game do you want to play today? And then I'm going to put the phone down. If they want to play, they might be like, whatever mom and be like at the park or whatever. But if they want to, I'm ready to put my work aside at 3 p.m. today and like bust out a game and play Jenga or Silly Street or something, right? So um, that kind of goes into the scheduling thing. But I mean, really scheduling is basically boundaries with time boundaries being um, enacted 
and implemented through time structure. So thanks for letting me go off on the side. Sarah's got some great things she's going to do here. Not setting myself on fire for others during the holidays, making time to practice my own damn music instead of just helping other folks. Yes. Putting that in the schedule. So a tangible way, what do I need to do that? Is putting it in the schedule just like an appointment, an appointment with yourself. And that those appointments, boundaries, just like your feelings, your appointments with yourself are just as important and I dare say more important than the appointments you have with clients. All right. So when you think about that, yep, all goes in the Google Calendar. Excellent, Sarah. So when you think about those three things, you're probably going to need some examples. So give me a check in here. Who feels like they've got this? No problem. Okay, I can do this. I don't need any help with language. And who feels like I would really love some language around some of these boundaries that I have to draw. Because oftentimes the boundaries, when we're trying to have the conversations, it's we get stuck because we don't know what to say. We don't know what to say because our insides are going, right? But we don't want to say it like that. We still need to be respectful to the other person. So, who feels like they need some language? And if you need language, I happen to be really good at language. Put into the chat what you'd love to get some language around. And I would love to be able to give you some reframes today. Um, because it's really easy for me to give you a bunch of tasks, <laughs> right? But then what if you can't actually do it? In fact, I want you to take a minute. I hope you have some paper with you and I want you to jot down some notes. What are some reframes? So we already said one and I'm gonna kind of do this like, in real time, I'm going to say we had that one about um, about talking, right? So talking politics, for example, politics, we can say, I would love to hear about that at another time. Today, I'd love to focus on what we have in common. How about that, right? I would love to hear about that at another time. Today, I'd love to focus on what we have in common. And then you can add to that by asking, what have you been doing for fun lately? Now, here's where you're gonna get in trouble, right? Because like, if it's my family and you're like, what have you been doing for fun lately? They're gonna be like, I've been marching for the rights of, you know, <laughs> which is great. But like, they're gonna say something political. So be careful with this one, right? Uh, what have you been doing for fun lately? You know, that's another one. Or what movies have you seen lately? You know, y'all, it's okay to keep it surfacey. It's okay to keep it surfacey if that's what's going to feel healthy and safe for you. All right, I don't have anybody giving me any good examples to try to work out here. All right, how about going into, while I wait for you to give me some examples and some language, why don't we talk about why it's so important to have these boundaries? Um, I think that there is a really, um, there's an underlying current that somehow boundaries are a luxury and that, um, you don't really need to have them only like, you only have them when you really need to have them, which again is a boundary issue in and of itself. Right. Um, but I think there's a misunderstanding of how valuable, you know, how valuable um, the boundary is. So, oh, yay, Jerry's here. How about, oh, this is, y'all, this is the one. How about the student who texts you all hours of the day to ask questions? So um, I have a twofold answer for this. And I'm glad you asked because I think that this can be, you know how we cut, I, I did a podcast with Nikki and I talked about boundaries versus velvet ropes. And I think this is a, a great thing. This is a really good question to ask. And I think it can happen in two ways. 
I think, first of all, you can put in your policies, and mind you, your bol- your policies are not your boundaries, okay? Your policy, you need boundaries in order to implement your policies, but your policies will not do the job for you. The piece of paper and the words on the page will never do the job of implementing a boundary. So, but I think you can like set yourself up for the conversation by putting something in a policy. So if this is where you ask, how do I want to spend my time with my clients? So if you have a section in your policies, and we talk about this in how to run and when I uh, do policy creation with clients, there's always a section on communication and what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, right? So this is when I would love to text with you between nine to five, uh, Monday through Friday. If you text me after that, you won't get a response. Um, until the following business day. Or you can just say, I don't do text with clients. You can't have my cell phone number. Or, you know, only email me, that kind of thing. Now, if you don't already have that set up and you need to draw a new boundary, which is what I'm thinking that Jerry is saying, is I think texting back something, I love this question and I will get to this question during our next lesson. Go ahead and make a note in your notes so that we, we're sure to talk about it, okay? Um, that's one thing you can say. The next thing you can do is if it keeps asking, it, you know, I would, I would draw the boundary a couple times in that kind of gentle way. I love this question. Let's talk about it at your next lesson. The second way you can say it is, I love this question. I don't answer texts between these hours. Thank you so much for asking it. I'll get back to you during my hours that I text, right? And you can establish that. Um, If they keep doing it over and over, then in the lesson, you're going to have to say, hey, I love that you have so many questions. I love it. What's getting hard is when you're constantly texting me, it pulls me away from being available 100% to my other clients. Um, And I'm going to go ahead and draw a boundary around that. So how do you think we could best work together? How do you think we could come to agreement on how to get those questions answered in a way that respects your need to have the answer and my need to not get texts all day long? Um, If you can get to an agreement, that is going to work better for you because people are generally agreeable right? Like they want to have an agreement with you. They want to come to a consensus. They want to come to, I understand how to operate in this relationship, right? So that's how I would do it, Jerry. Um, The other thing you could do if it's really hard and you haven't already established that you don't do, you know, because here's the hard part, right? How many of us, and if Karen is still watching, don't be mad that I say this, but how many of us are like, DM me anytime, just text me with any question anytime, email me anytime, because in our brain, we're thinking, surely this person is not really going to email me all the time. Surely this person isn't going to text me all day long, you know, and we kind of screw ourselves over a little bit by being so friendly and accessible. So that's why you've got to really figure out, well, if a student did, I don't, you know, I don't know if this is your situation, Jerry, but if a student really does like, okay, I'll just take advantage of that. That helps us realize, oh, maybe I have a different boundary than I thought I did. (laughs) So if we can hold back and try not to say, oh, text me anytime, message me anytime, DM me anytime, I'm here for you, right? We have to, we have to be careful. Now, I love what Karen is saying here because, by the way, Karen and I talk about this all the time, so that's why I feel comfortable kind of calling her out. What Karen has learned to do um, is she just doesn't worry about having the unread text. So the other thing, Jerry, and maybe other people, um, I know I was having this conversation with somebody else. It's like, I don't know about you, but it's real hard for me to see like a bunch of like, I don't know what it is, a bunch of uh, unreads on my phone or whatever. So it's hard for me to get the unreads and not deal with them. (laughs) But I've learned. I used to be really bad at it and now I'm much, much better at it. 
Um, and this is why I tell people to email me. So here's another one. If you get a text, if you're just starting to learn this and you get a text that's a question from a student, the other thing you can try is, I love this question. Can you email it to me so that I can remember to answer it? And then my email is, if you don't email me, I'm going to forget I got this text message. Just be honest. I am going to forget I got this text message. So y'all, you better email me the question. And that way you're not opening up your email all the time. You know, like you, you, we don't have the same relationship with email that we do with text messaging. And we don't have the same expectation of response the way, right? I'm going to tell you what, as soon as Apple figures out how to mark texts unread, I'm, I, I literally think I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry a thousand tears once they figure that out, out of joy, because I just read, like, oh, that's the problem, too. And I'm also very honest. That's the problem, too. You read it, and then you totally forget. I'm like, oh, my God, three weeks later, right? Okay. Anyway, so I hope that's helpful, Jerry. That's what you can absolutely do. Um, oh, I was going to say, here's an extreme thing. I got an extreme, I, I have an extreme for you, but if you need it and it helps you draw the boundary, you can do it. And that is this, get yourself another phone that is for personal. Your current phone, take everything off of it, except because everybody has the number, right? So use that one for your business, get a new personal phone with a personal line, tell all the people that you want to be able to reach out to you on your personal cell and all of your fun apps that you love to use and stuff on your personal cell, great. And then leave the current phone like a landline. Do you, do you do, how many of you actually know what a landline is, right? Leave your business phone in your office when when it's not business time. And then your new phone and your new phone number is what you can slowly bring people into. Now, that's an extreme because it's going to cause some other things that you have to deal with, right? Like it's going to cost more money, number one. Number two, um, it's, you know, you might have to carry both phones for a while um, and certain things. Like I, I do a lot of work uh, when I'm on vacation. And that's something that we have intentionally planned. And then if I'm not going to do work, I let all my clients know, you know. Um, but, you know, who wants to carry around two phones? I don't know. But you could try it. You could try it. <laughs> Sarah's like, <laughs> Sarah's like, oh my God, what? <laughs> and then we got totally thinking about that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Mark on Red would be game changer for me, for sure. Me. Okay. All right. Next. Let's see. I got to scroll because I think. Yeah, I love Meredith has has a thing. You can message me anytime along with I'll get back to you within 24 hours. Yeah. So that's that's one of those things where you're like being inviting and you're drawing a boundary. I will say this. When we... When we don't have a lot of clients when we're early on, it's it's easy to say, oh, yeah, anytime, because it's not actually cramping your style. Like if they text you, they text you. You're not busy. But the reason why I encourage you to figure out the boundaries now is as you get more and more and more clients, you're just not going to be able to handle it. And you're going to need as a self-nurturing the ability to walk away from that um cool cool reading 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 okay jennifer is saying inappropriate questions can you so like a student is asking an inappropriate question um why do you ask want to know so are you saying that's what you would like to have language around and can you give me an example, one that feels safe to give, like just make something up, even if it's about like what's your favorite cheese or something like that. Help me understand how to answer that question. And then I will. OK. No, that was back with family. Yeah, yeah. OK, so if a family member is like 
asking something that doesn't feel appropriate to you, it is okay for you to say, um, that's not something that I'm comfortable discussing with you at that at, at this time. I would love to talk about other things though. It's like literally just tell the truth. If you're not comfortable talking about something, say, I'm not comfortable talking about that. It's okay to do, it's okay to say how you feel, <laughs> right? I, I mean, I know that's kind of like a little obvious, but Jennifer, I would, I would totally encourage you. If someone asks you an inappropriate question, you can say that doesn't feel like an appropriate question for the level of relationship that we have. That doesn't feel like a question that I feel safe to answer today. I'd love to get to know you better. I mean, unless you don't want to get to know them better, don't say that. But, you know, I'd love to get to know you better so that we can be at a place where that is a question that I feel 100% comfortable and confident talking about with you. You know, I'm or I'm still working out my feelings around how I want to respond to different questions. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass on answering that one. Do you have another question for me? It's all about being honest. I think that's the hardest part, right? If I'm honest, what will they do? If I'm honest, honest, what will they think? If I'm honest, will they be mad at me? Will they hate me? Will they think I'm awful? Right? Yeah. Well, people and family all up in the business, all up in business isn't theirs to have. Yeah. So my question would be, Jennifer, why do they think it's okay to have it? And of course, you can't determine what another person believes. But to just kind of think through, why do, I th why do they think that it's okay to ask me that? Where, where are they lacking boundaries? And where are people pushing their boundaries in their life that they have like no clue that this is inappropriate? You know? And then you're actually doing them a favor by showing them and modeling them. You're allowed to say what you want and need. Now, with that caveat, y'all, if you have not been a boundary setter, I can guarantee you people going to be mad at you. People going to be mad and all been out of shape because the only people that get mad about you drawing boundaries are the people who benefited from you not having them. So if you have not had them and then all of a sudden you draw some, it's going to throw people for a loop because they're used to you not having boundaries and they benefited from that. They got their like kicks out of it or they got something that they wanted. They got your time. They got your money. They got your energy. They got you showing up for them when they don't show up for you. You've got all sorts of things that you're going to confront with a gentle little boundary. Is it worth it? Yes. 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 Is it worth the momentary discomfort? Is it worth not talking for two months to a person who's toxic to you? Absolutely, it is worth it. It is worth losing relationships over your self-identity and your self-worth. Yes, I said that out loud. It is, I'm going to say it again. It is worth losing relationships with people who do not respect you and do not honor your boundaries. It is okay to say goodbye to those people. Um, Grace had said something up here. I have trouble getting my 10 year old to understand that there are some times when I have to work and other times I can spend with her. She and I also have different ideas about what spending time together should look like. That's awesome. That's so real. Well, and Grace too, like I know that your daughter has, an, has also some other communication needs. So how have you tried like sitting down together and making lists? Like, do you think that would work? Hey, I want you to draw some pictures and make a list of what spending time with me looks like. What do, what do we do together when we're spending time together? What, uh, what are we talking about? What activities are we enjoying? And then you draw your list. I'm going to draw my picture too. This is what we're doing when I'm enjoying time with you and when we're spending time together. And then you can look at the lists together and you can say, oh, which things are the same and which things are different? Which things line up? Um, sometimes too with my 10-year-old, I have to, um, he tell, he can tell time. So, you know, I don't know if your 10 year old tell, tells time really well. Um, my seven year old can't tell time very well yet, but I, I always say, put on your alarm, put on your alarm. Cause he has a little, like a little Timex watch. And I say, put an alarm on. And when that alarm goes off, you can come and talk to me, you know, at 5 PM or at two 30, if I know I'm getting out. So, um, that's something you can do. 
Another thing that I've done in the past with my kids is um, they broke it, so I don't do it anymore, but it really worked and it set us up. So even after it broke, it kind of still worked is I got these big time um, hourglasses. So, and I would say, okay, and it would be like an hour long. There's like an hour long, a half hour. I got like a big set and I said, okay, I need an hour. And I would flip over the hourglass and we could all, you know, I could check on the hourglass that was out there so that I could turn around and see. And when that hourglass is empty, you know, when it's all done, then you can come talk to me. But you can't talk to me when the hourglass is going. And even though we don't have that anymore, that kind of set us up for that boundary stuff and gave it a tangible understanding of time and a tangible understanding of no it's not time yet so maybe that would work I don't I don't know how visual um I don't know every kid is different right so that's why it's hard it's like I love parenting blogs right and every time I read a parenting blog I'm like this is such a racket because parenting is so different for every single person (laughs) right so funny but let me know yeah haven't tried list but sounds like a good Thanksgiving project awesome Okay. Hi. Oh, y'all. Leah Partridge is, have you heard her? I mean, she's just an incredible person. I adore you, Leah. I set boundaries last year and didn't come home because of COVID. My family has been very distant ever since. Yeah. Now my sister has only invited me through a Facebook invite to the family events without the usual phone call to see what would be best for me and my immediate family. How do we deal with the unspoken differences of how we all have dealt with COVID? Well, I think you just answered your own question with that question. I'll point that out in a second. I still don't know who is vaccinated and don't know if the event is planned to be outside. What are some words that don't sound judgy, but get my needs met? Oh, that's a good one. I love that. Okay, I'm going to leave that big one up on the screen just to make sure I get every point. Okay, Leah. Um, first of all, I think you said something really important. How do we deal with the unspoken differences? You got to speak them. You got to speak them. Somebody has to be the grown person and make the phone call and say, Hey, I want to talk about our differences in risk tolerance. I want to talk to you about how we're navigating this differently so that we can come to something that works for both of us, so that I understand where you're at and you understand where I'm at, and that we can just agree, maybe we disagree on it, maybe we have two different risk tolerances, but that we at least can respect that and then be open around it rather than feeling like I'm getting shunned and I'm getting punished or however you feel um, by not, having the conversation like let's have the hard conversation you are important enough to me to have a hard conversation so I think the first thing is how do we deal with the unspoken differences well you speak them out um second I still don't know who is vaccinated and I don't know if it's planned to be outside okay So I'm going to be really careful with this answer because I think you're making a connection. Um, I want to be really careful with this answer because I have some nuanced opinions around this that is that people just unless we have a conversation, it's hard to do on a Facebook live. So just please have grace. Believe the best about me. The only thing At this point, based on what we know, the only thing that can ensure that you do not get sick is not the vaccination, okay? I think it's been shown that the vaccine is not, it's more like a flu shot where if you get sick, you you know, there's data around how it's not as bad, right? So I think focusing on being vaccinated while on one sense could decrease your risk tolerance because um, people would be less sick, I think the real conversation is what are you afraid of? And if it is you are afraid of being sick, you are afraid of getting other people sick, you are afraid of 
um, COVID in general, like I, I don't know what the actual fear is, but if you can like really pull out what's wrong with it, then I think that you can address that issue in a different way. So for example, if the fear is I don't want to get sick, then the answer may or may not be the vaccine. The answer may be, hey, could we all agree to take rapid tests the day before? Could we all agree to have social distancing? Could we all agree to um, wear masks and social distancing? Or I'm going to wear a mask. I'm totally comfortable if you don't wear a mask. Figure out what you're actually afraid of and then see if there is another way to address that risk without turning it into what has become an extremely either or right or wrong this or that conversation around the vaccination because i think part of why the vaccination conversation is so difficult and again just hear me out Part of why it's so difficult is because how binary it's become and it's become one of those like hot, I mean, it's become a hot button issue. It's been highly politicized instead of um, a conversation about risk tolerance for people who choose not to be vaccinated. There's some, they have risk they have some risk tolerances that they're not willing to cross, just like people who are vaccinated have risk tolerances that they're not willing to cross. So really having the conversation about the risk tolerance for both sides is the real conversation. And um, that's not going to be fun, but it's necessary if you want to move through the relationship. Now, the good thing about conflict with people who you can agree love you, because I think your family loves you and you love your family, is that usually conflict plus resolution, healthy conflict plus healthy resolution will usually equal intimacy. It will usually equal, wow, we got through something hard together. And you can prep the conversation with, I want to get through this hard thing together because I love you and I trust you. Let people know that you trust them. And if you don't trust them, that's a different issue, right? And then do you even want to hang out with them anyway? Um, so, so to that end, what are some words that don't sound judgy but get my needs met are really figure out what your needs are and then ask for a conversation that says, I want to honor what you are doing and I want you to honor what I'm doing because I really want us to have family time together and then just have the hard conversation get the information first and then make a decision about what your risk tolerance allows for you to do with that Leah is that helpful and again this is a very interesting sticky thing to just say on a Facebook live when we're not I mean like I would love for this to be way more dialogue driven when we're talking about this kind of stuff um, but I hope that that's helpful for now. OK. All right. I just realized we have been going and going for 53 minutes. And I really hope that anything that you got out of this today um, was um, I just hope that it helped a little bit. So to recap, we want to know that we want to really figure out how we want to spend our time really figure out how we want to feel over the next six weeks. Oop, that's big and weird. Let's do that. And then we really want to figure out what support we need so that we can implement those boundaries that we have around um, what it looks like to be interacting with our family, with our friends and with our clients. All right. I'm going to let you go. I hope you have a fantastic Thanksgiving. I'm drawing a boundary around my time. I've only got a couple sessions today, tomorrow, and then I'm going to take the weekend off and then I'm taking all next week off, you know, so um, if you see me online, then it's because I want to be there for fun, right? Not for work. Please have a fantastic holiday week. If you are in a nation that is not celebrating Thanksgiving this week and you are highly involved with United States people, take a break with us. Just take a day off. All right. <laughs> have a fantastic. I said that a lot of times. So, OK, I'm done. Have a great Thanksgiving. Bye.